Firstly, I want to pay my respects to the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and to honour their elders past and present. There are several Indigenous authors here tonight and I want to acknowledge them all, um, the ones I know anyhow. Jane Harrison's here, Tony Birch and also Alexis Wright. So thank you for honouring us with your presence as well. In 1993, a novel appeared under the name of an unknown Indigenous author. The novel was True Country. The author was Kim Scott. The novel broke new ground in Australian Indigenous writing. It dispensed with a single authorial voice. Instead, we had multiple narratives. The author plainly had drawn on his life experiences, but it was not autobiography. It used the freedom of fiction to explore questions of identity, of becoming and being Aboriginal. The novel was poetic, not beautiful writing as an end in itself, rather the word and the syntax straining to represent the unspoken and unacknowledged psychic and social realities in which Aboriginal lives are enveloped. It critiqued the Aboriginal Affairs governance of the 1990s, representations of the flying squads of bureaucrats visiting remote communities with their solutions and flying out again. <coughs> Aboriginal studies in southern courses in southern universities were examined and found to be lacking and irrelevant in many cases. The rhetoric of community development, which sustained Aboriginal people as well as bureaucrats, was also critiqued. This is Kim Scott's mode. It's unsparing, it's honest, it's rigorous. He went on to examine the folly of those people who believe traditional Aboriginal culture alone can address the challenges of modernity. He also spoke the truth of hate crimes directed against Aboriginal people in Australia. And also finally of Aboriginal justice. Clearing this ground, the author then began to enumerate the strengths of Aboriginal culture, the wisdom of the elders, the capacity to take a long-term view of the problems and also of the possible solutions, and the possibility of building a new, building a new, of singing our place a little bit better each day, of finding the true country. Kim Scott has continued to speak from the heart and has gone on to write further books that are intellectually and politically fearless. He has also been patient with his readers, allowing us time to internalise and inhabit this renewed vision of Australia that he creates. A vision which includes settler and Aboriginal people. Benang, of course, is a landmark of Australian literature a complex book addressing complex social realities and the intertwining of settler and Aboriginal destinies in contemporary Australia, moving increasingly to concerns that focus more on the community than the individual, he's authored Kayang and Me, and most recently, That Dead Man Dance. As we sing our place a little bit better, local becomes a bridge to the universal in the work of Kim Scott. We've come here tonight to honour Kim Scott as a major Australian writer, as a major international writer, as someone who shows new possibilities for Australian and Aboriginal writers to actually be part of a world literature, but also to speak importantly to all Australians. Professor Scott, I'm going to invite you to speak to us to continue the story. I'd also like to acknowledge and pay respects to traditional owners past and present. Um, and I felt a little bit out of place, I must say, walking up to the front here with my little shopping bag with my books in there, getting out my exercise book uh, of notes about which I hope to uh, speak today. 
and struggling to get the PowerPoint device out of my pocket as well. Look, I'm extremely flattered to be here. Um, as those writers that are here today that have been mentioned already would know, it's uh, mainly solitary work. And it's a little bit, always a little bit awkward for me uh, moving into these sort of spaces. It's a very grand title that we have for the lecture today too. <laughs> Language and Notion, Nation. <laughs> I'll make a terrible start here. I hope I can do justice to that, the grandeur of the vision implied by the title. We're really... Uh, I want to sort of uh, muddle along, talk about um, little things really. That's where, that's where you can build stuff from, it always seems to me. And I'm far from home and a lot of my writing, as Philip's already mentioned, is in that local and exploratory mode really, as much as anything. I use stories and writing, that's the way I try and think things through. And I, I want to reflect a little bit on um, stories from home, uh, lands stories associated with a particular landscape, the south coast of WA, and uh, sounds too, and what we might learn from that. So this may or may not be relevant. I, I can only thank you and ask for your continued goodwill, and then we'll work out if there's what it suggests, what I've riffed and raved about, about language and nation and, dare I say it, identity and belonging. I'll see if um, this works. Uh, I quite often like to put up this little image. It's a very humble little waterhole in ancestral country, close to what's um, sort of infamous in the Noongar community also as massacre country back in the 19th century. Um, and I won't talk a, a lot about this image, probably. Um, I, I like to put it up, well, maybe at, toward the end of what I'm speaking will, will make more sense, but I like to put it up just to sort of soothe me as much as anything. Um, and it occurred to me it may be relevant today to reflect upon uh, my last time I gave a public lecture of any sort of size was uh, I think 2001 in Melbourne that is I'm talking about and I started with this image and I always feel awkward putting this image up um, but I'd like to today partly because it was you know, 11 years ago or something, I, I started off with this. Partly because confronting this image in the state archives at home when I was attempting, attempting to find a narrative, a way to talk history and family history, was uh, a really uh, unpleasant sort of experience. Uh, and at that time, 11 or so years ago, Starting with this, I talked not so much, uh, I didn't think, Noongar identity or Aboriginal identity. I used this, I attempted to use this to speak about Australian identity and perhaps a psychosis in, uh, in a sense of Aust Australian identity that, and I, I plucked these ideas from a book by Bob Hodge and Vijay Mishra called Dark Side of the Dream where they talked about there's something in the Australian psyche that needs to keep Aboriginality outside of itself in the interests of its own psychic welfare, its own, its own secure sense of identity, its own sense of solidarity. And I think some of these things are still relevant. It's also been, I think this image was used quite early on in, in the Rabbit Proof Fence, the film, and Stephen Kinane, the, a writer who I really deeply respect, not only for his writing, but also the other work that he does in terms of community development and cultural consolidation, refers to, to it in his book, uh, Shadow Lines, I think is the title. 
the other thing that struck me was finding this in the archives back way back then was that's where you find the language of our shared history, the notions of identity, the notions of history, the possibilities or not of finding a connection between contemporary wider society and regional indigenous roots. And in, those, in all those instances, is this great silence, sounds a bit glib to say this, there's in, certainly in, an inadequate discourse for the sort of things I care about when I went to the archives writing that book all that time ago. And it still hits me when I encounter this image. Being perverse, I kept this image and another one, a family uh, image, in some ways similar, in some ways very different, I think, uh, by me as I wrote that book. And I often return, Ben, and I often return to these. Um, that previous image seems to me, you know, they've got their backs, it's family photo. They've got their backs to one another, staring at some uh, imagined future, perhaps, somewhere over here to our left. It's got all that race, the language of racism in there to try and articulate connections or lack of connections between these people versus this other one taken not that far from that waterhole that I had up there earlier on. One could argue is similarities in the differences in uh, skin colour and so on, but they're hanging on to one another and I somehow there's some sort of non-verbal thing in this photo family photo, my family photo, that uh, I think I spend a lot of work, time trying to put the words to in one way or another about belonging, about hanging on to a sense of connection <laughs> in ancestral country, in hostile circumstances. And I'm probably not giving you really good uh, value here in reiterating old stuff, but I wanted to keep that there. Now I'll go to, back to the Waterhole, and I wanted to read just the last paragraph or so from Benung. And as I say, I know this may be retreading old ground, but it'll make hopefully it'll make some sense as we proceed. Here's the last um, few paragraphs. Put it this way: you won't have to read the book now. I just give you the last page. <laughs> Speaking from the heart, I tell you that I'm part of a much older story, one of a perpetual billowing from the sea with its rhythm of return, return and remain. Even now we gather on chilly evenings, sometimes only a very few of us, sometimes more. We gather our strength in this way, from the heart of all of us, pale, burnt and shriveled. I hover in the campfire smoke and sing as best I can. I am not alone. I acknowledge that there are many stories here in the ashes below my feet even my grandfather's white grandfather. I look out across the small crowd, hoping it will grow, hoping to see Uncle Will's children and those of his sisters and theirs in turn, and my father's other children. There is smoke and ash in my skin and in my heart too. I offer these words especially to those of you I embarrass and who turn away from the shame of seeing me, or perhaps it is because your eyes smart as the wind blows the smoke a little toward you, and you hear something like a million, million, many-sized hearts beating, and the whispering of waves, leaves, grasses. We are still here, Benang. And in many ways, I think it's appropriately sincere of me to say. When I was right at that point writing that book, that last draft even, I was wishing and I was hoping for something like that. To be something like that narrator, albeit he's ugly and disfigured and something of a freak, but he is making these sounds which are not described in that novel, which I was thinking as a metaphor for indigenous language. He makes the sounds of place. And he's in ancestral country and there's a small, tiny crowd, a community of descendants, 
other people descended from that place. And they are speaking from their hearts, merging their hearts, recovering and consolidating a heritage and reconnecting with that pre-colonial heritage in that place. And that sort of leaked out from between the, the language of the archives in my mind. That's what I'm trying to do in that book as I see it. Uh, at the same, around that same sort of time, I was uh, like um, maybe some other p Aboriginal people across the continent working on reconnecting uh, re well to that pre-colonial heritage and doing it via people is how I see it. And encountering, um, which I hadn't had the privilege for various reasons, earlier in my life, uh, rhythms of ancestral language and oral history stuff. So I want to share something of that, which is from a later book I did with uh, Hazel Brown. And a bunch of us did a, a, a little tour of schools in the southwest a few weeks ago now. I think the English Teachers Association of WA has a little film clip on their website if anyone wants to search it out of us having a go at doing this song. It's, uh, I don't know why I mentioned that, because it's horribly embarrassing for me. <laughs> That's perversity for you. But on this school too, Auntie Hazel, as she, did, as, she, as she did with me years ago when we did it in this book together, was talking to kids about, not something like in that other photo, you know, about moving away from community and skin colour having something to do with a loss of identity. She was talking about, because there was a group of us and we all call ourselves Willem and Noongar, and that we'd tell this to the kids, tell them some stories we put together, and I'll go through some images of this later on, and uh, how we put the stories together and who we are. And we put up a little map thing, southwest of WA, and we point to ancestral country. We'd point the kids, Anybody, any of you kids speak Noongar language? Oh, no. And then we point out all the names of towns in the southwest, Katanning and Noangarup and Kojanup and Nyabing and Pinjali, all these Noongar place names. And then they're starting to speak language. And this is our early bit of starting to bring. This stuff matters. This is where the energy and the life is. Auntie Hazel would talk about, ah, oh, we're Willem and Noongar. She'd say, that means we're like, we've got this, we're related to this particular bird, this curly. And she'd tell them a little bit about this bird, this shy, long-legged <laughs> bird, <laughs> nocturnal bird, this bird that specialises in camouflage. And she'd say to the kids, and you could be walking around and you don't even know the bird's there. It doesn't fly away or run away. It just hides there and you can't even see it unless its eyes opens its eye and looks at you. Then you see it. Yeah, that interests me, that. And she'd, then she'd talk about its scary sound. And when I was a kid, you used to, it's endangered like so many other things. You'd hear this, the call of this bird. And a lot of other Noongar communities, families, call it a death bird. It does have these associations with danger and the, and the realm of the spirit. And then, and it's in the book we did together, but she'd, when we're doing it with kids, she'd start doing it in the second person, I think you call it. And she'd say, there's this little spot down on the coast, uh, Hunter River. You might, some of you might come there with us sometime. And we'd drive in in a flash four-wheel drive to this little, heading to this river. And we'd have to stop even the flashes, the four-wheel drives can't get in this far. And we'd have to walk in there. And she'd say, you might be with Kim or we had a fellow called Ezard there or Iris or Roma, one of these others, Clint. You'd go in, there'd be just a few of us, couldn't be all of us, only just, you know, the first couple of rows here, maybe we'd go in. And we'd get to a certain point close there, and uh, whoever's leading you in, they're going to stop us, clear a bit of bush, because it's very bushy there, dig a hole, light a fire in the hole, put in some green bushes, and all this smoke will come around us. And you'll be there, and... You won't even know who, who's next to you. And you might grab that person next to you, hang on to them because you'd be getting scared. You're getting scared because you hear 
as that smoke comes, you hear all the voices, this scary sound of these curlews, this willem and mayawangi coming all around. You hear them in front of you and behind and to both sides. And then as the smoke clears, she says, someone will just clap their hands and then we can keep going because that's the spirits of our old people letting us know that they know we've come back into that place. And somehow in that, what I'm getting at is coming from that photo before to something like that, saying this is what you are, where you get recognised, you're Wilhelmanunga, you get recognised when you come back to this place and those voices will speak to you. There's sound, there's ceremony, there's stories, there's people descended from that place, reconnecting with that place via those means. This is what it, this is what it is, but this is what we are. This is who you are. And I wanted to just float that um, through as this other way of thinking about oneself or about ourselves other than what was in the archives. That sort of racist, narrow-minded stuff. And that it relies on people and relationships, language, ceremony, place, antiquity, the responsibility and obligations of being a descendant of people that first created human society in that part of the world and kept that, keep that sense of society alive. Uh, so that stuff that I'd started the next few years after Berna comes from that last page in many ways, it seems to me. And I, and I like to think it's something to do with the power of story as a driver, I think they say, these days, or an engine, or a motor, just something that a story can keep things moving along. Uh, and what I'd like to do with you, dear listeners, and some of you readers, I'd like to go through a l explaining a little bit of a process that I've been involved with just before I started writing that last novel, That Dead Man Dance, but I've tried to keep alive and keep things happening so that I can let myself work against those political imperatives with the literature to be, be useful politically. And so I can be a little bit more um, complex or ambiguous and intimate with a, in the literary fiction and work with this language regeneration stuff and community development or whatever the words are and hope that's a good and useful balance. So I'd like to go through some things of that, some parts of that process uh, and uh, I'll be pretty quick with this. I'll just fly over but lots of images here and also what I'm trying to do is shine a spotlight, even though I'm here at the moment, away from myself more onto some other things that are happening and get some more people at the interface, cultural interface. I talked a bit about this in the Miles Franklin oration a few weeks ago, so I hope I'm not just uh, reiterating meaninglessly, but let's see how we go. So I hope I've indicated already with Arnie Hazel, with Hazel Brown, I, she'd given me lots of language, got to start there, and her siblings and others in that community. And we started documenting stuff, but it didn't go in the book we were doing together, but it's sort of cultural consolidation work, as I call it. About, uh, about 2000, I found out about this archival stuff that had been collected in Albany in 1930. Gone back to the States, the linguist, changed jobs, and the paperwork came back to Australia 10 or 20 years ago. I don't know. It was here, back here before I heard, a long time before I heard about it. International phonetic alphabets are pretty deadly in that sort of sense, interesting. Puts the names of the informants at the top. Bob Roberts was a name of this. Um, I want to put up a photo here. That's the paperwork. Here's the elders that some of them particularly very, Arnie Hazel's second on the right, I think. Sec uh, on the left, Helen Hall, Helen Nelly, Ing, Auntie Ing. Her dad spoke to this linguist back there in 1930. Next to her, Lomas Roberts, 
the name on that last bit of paperwork, Bob Roberts, is his uncle. Was his uncle. Fellow, the dapper gentleman in the hat in the middle, Gerald Williams Sr., his dad spoke to this linguist, Simon Williams. Hazel Brown next to him, Audrey Brown. These people all remembered these in informants, you say, called them uncle. So, but they didn't, hadn't heard all those stories necessarily for a whole complex range of reasons to do the denigration and attempted destruction of this sort of heritage. What we did, oh, and then the fellow in the middle, Russell Nelly, his dad spoke to the, George Nelly spoke to the linguist. But George Nelly died when this oh, fellow in the middle, Uncle Russell, was still in his mother's womb, I think, or still a baby. So he didn't get to hear these stories. What we did was we got that group of people, about 17 people connected with this stuff, get together in Albany where the stories were recorded, my hometown, that's pretty well ancestral country. Gave, we had about 50 people there. Within 10 minutes, everybody's crying. I, not completely clear, I think it was good tears. I think they were feeling like I was about, uh, we were doing something important and there was this reconnection thing happening. Um, we gave the stories back to these contemporary elders from that were recorded back then. And then we pick one or two of them. Um, I'd written them out on these big sheets of paper, put them on the ground, uh, the way you write Noongar today, International Phonetic Alphabet, a bit of translation when we could. We recorded for a couple of days us going through these two or three stories, remembering other stuff, disagreeing with the original, the linguist stuff, arguing amongst ourselves about who knows most and who doesn't and how you speak different words and remembering those informants, stories about them and other stories they'd told that might have got not have gotten this paperwork. And these are, I'm speeding up now, these are shots of that. Then a couple of us put together a text based upon listening to those recordings and we get someone to show us how to put pictures to those stories. And here's some of this happening. Another weekend, nice way to creep up on an endangered language and how it touches the psyche, I think. How come I don't know this stuff? I'm thinking to myself, maybe some others are as well. Um, how come I don't know all these words? How come I don't know these stories? Can get can make you feel vulnerable. And doing artwork, it seems to me, is a, just a gentle way of sort of playing with those stories in little groups of us. So these are some of the... So after that we turned them into picture books, got some words, Noongar in English, got some illustrations, make them up into books and hand out 50 to 100 in Albany to the Noongar community because not everyone is lucky enough to have their dad or granddad or uncle speak to that linguist. And this stuff in our experience can sometimes exacerbate factions and divisions in community. What we're trying to do is a way of return and consolidate this heritage. People can take them home and photocopy them and come up with their own version based upon this, etc. And we have an exhibition of the artwork that's been produced. So this is Helen Nelly, Helen Hall, Auntie Ying, showing some of the artwork she's done on her dad's story to some of her close family. Uh, that image I've just put there to show you the way we handed the books back with the red, black and gold colours and stuff. This, which might look a little bit like the Wiggles, uh, <laughs> I don't know. I, when I looked at this this afternoon, I thought, I don't know. If I, look at those T-shirts. We look like the Wiggles. This is uh, that school tour I mentioned uh, when Arnie Hazel was telling that story a few weeks ago. And this is the bunch of us that, that go and talk about the stories and how we're putting them together. Um, I'll just go through these. So we do some songs, we do some stories in language and English. We, and I think this is important, we talk about how we put them together, all these workshops stuff. Um, 
And what comes out of doing this, this is the bit that interests me. This is the, why I'm talking about this stuff. The stuff that goes on around. So someone's, the beloved Ed Brown wrote a song in language about going fishing, inspired by this other sort of work we're doing. Next week, the whole school sang that song that he'd written in Noongar language at the assembly. And it's his kids and his grannies who are leading that process. So unlike that psychosis bit I mentioned before, you know, Aboriginality and Aboriginal people being on the outside, this, is, this sort of stuff brings you right to the guts of things. And suddenly your kids and families at a school, here's our song, we're doing it assembly, everybody's doing it. We're up front. There's a leadership thing happening. It's not just receiving, uh, you know, being welfare recipients, they're closing the gap stuff, which is important as all that is, of course. There's something else starts going on and it comes out of story and language and sound and people. Then what we do is a film connecting those couple of stories we've worked with to landscape the way elders tell us. And in doing that we also have an opportunity, we had an opportunity to go with a bunch of these elders and they tell us about camping grounds, with dancing grounds, schools they went to, farms they camped on. And we put together a two hour, edited down to two hour film and we hand out 50 or 100 of those copies as well. So it's the return, which sometimes gets just overly political I think, in terms of it divides people. It's a return and consolidation of a heritage in its home community of descendants and empowering individuals in that community through sharing, controlled sharing of that heritage and that puts you, you've got interest that we find you get in people who are interested, non-Aboriginal people increasingly are interested in this pre-colonial heritage. It's not like it was a few decades ago, but we still got to, still got to come through the people, that community of descendants. So that's sort of ever widening concentric circles is another way I put it, ever expanding audiences, working from trust of a small group. And how am I going with time here, Philip? Um, do I need, have I got a few minutes still? This is Auntie Hazel walking across. She's, she stopped the cars. We had three four-wheel drives we'd hired on this film trip. No institutional involvement with any of this work until the last month or so. Stop here, she says, jumps the fence and takes us up to, and I'm sorry if you've heard this before, but I'd like to repeat this. It's over-cleared country. It's stolen country. It's damaged, it's devastation. A community that belongs here, characterised, I think, by a fair bit of trauma and turbulence and grief, these things that are in the community I know. She takes, she jumps over with her walking stick, I think you might be able to see that in the image, leads us across this dusty, devastated paddock to a rocky outcrop and points out these circles that go smaller and larger on the rock and then tells us this story that anthropologists have recorded it as well about the moon and the kangaroo talking to one another, Yonga, Miak, and the kangaroo's going to die. And he says, my bones are going to turn grey in the sun, dry, crack as the hill grows up around me. What about you? The moon says, I, I get really sick, but I don't die. I come back again. You know, that's the new moon again. And here we were, this bunch of Willem and Noongar in ancestral country. This is the last page of Benang, a little bit, I like to think. Gathering around, telling these stories. Yeah, this story is not over yet, this shared history story. We've been damaged, but we're coming back strong again through story, sound, landscape and its people. So it was just amazing, for me anyway, it was astounding to stand there like that and being, doing what I was wishing and hoping for. 
And I've got some shots here, as I close, draw to a close, of just some of us Wheelam and Noongar people gathered at these workshops. Uh, this is the second one. A few more kids there, I think, in this one. Uh, this is the first back in 2006, I think. And we lost a lot of people. Look at these photos. And I've been to these individuals' funerals and we show their images and we call their names. But we lost a lot of people from five or six years ago. And this, a lot more young people in this one, this is at the launch of a couple of books that came out of this language process. And it's the flashiest place in the town of Albany. <laughs> and a lot of... There's a Noongar person working there, Gillian Woods, and I mentioned that to pay respect to her. But it's quite difficult to get a lot of Noongar people to a place like that, the Albany Entertainment Centre. But we got a lot in that day. And here's some of us looking happy through this building up community, through this language and story process, I hope. Youngsters, all, all kinds, and elders. And one of the, I'll just, here's a quote about, from an Aboriginal academic, if I can put it like that, about the story of language loss, language retention, the sort of things I'm trying to speak of here, revitalization that these in themselves can tell a narrative and a story of shared history, of dispossession and of persistence and I would like to think of recovery, like that moon story, endangered language, community damaged, you know, all that legis apartheid-like legislation for so long and then it's meant to be all switched around quick as that. These processes I'm speaking of here, this language, story, sound stuff, and a home community of descendants, ever-expanding circles, widening circles, concentric circles, empowering individuals through being at the interface in a controlled way. It, ex it excites and uh, really interests me in ways I can't explain that well. These workshops we regular, I said, we're all crying within five or ten minutes of that first one. That happens lots. When we finished the school tour and the little bunch of us that presented were sitting together, we just went through, ah, so how did it go? And we started crying then too. I'm not a soft character, I don't think, but it's just the emotional, spiritual, psychic intensity of, and the pride of being in a position to be doing this. We are bringing these old stories, songs, our old people's stories and songs back. We are instruments for bringing this back. No better manifestation of the spirit of place than songs and stories and language. And not only that, when normally we only get together, as some of the elders say, at funerals like this, we got fragments of stories of old people who've passed away that we're bringing back to life. That's part of what the tears are about. We are reworking our history. We are strengthening our connection to that pre-colonial heritage in a way so we can frame that shared history stuff within that, from that position. I think there's healing happening, not only for those of us involved and getting powerful through the sharing, controlled sharing, but also for non-Aboriginal people, like that psych thing I mentioned before, there's a need for healing in there as well. And it also puts, in our case, Noongar people back at the, we're at the centre of things. And it's a, it's a power relationship that's transformed. And I want to offer a couple of examples. When we, I mentioned we hand out these stories at these gatherings, this fella here, I won't use his name at this point, but he's, um, which may be wrong, may be right, he's a descendant of one of the pioneering families. And Auntie Hazel and her siblings, I think it's fair to say, worked like slaves, as did their parents on that property. Yet, old girl said to me, invite him along as well. It's nearly all Noongars there, and there was a few non-Aboriginal people that were invited, him being one of them. And she and the others 
those elders in that first photo that I put up there, said, um, give him the stories as well. He knows a bit of Noongar language. It's just sort of politically incorrect to say this. I'm thinking, what do you want to do that for? And you can, I think you can see tears in his eyes as he's walking back with these stories. So there's a strange power relationship, something shifted there that I, that pleases me. Here's another photo, and I also talked about this a few weeks ago. This is in, on a homestead, a farm, where that's infamous for this massacre or this killing, a lot of killing occurring late 19th century. And because of these stories and the relationships that come out of working in a really regional, small way, the people that own that property now, and I, write, I wrote a lightly fictionalised version of this a couple of years ago, and it was in one of those best Australian stories thing, A Refreshing Sleep, invited us back to that homestead. And then, with my beloved Noongar brother, Edward Brown, we, they sh the farmers there that owned the property showed us water holes that still had the slabs left over them. We, so this shot is of us, the slab being lifted in this water hole in country that's hostile. And uh, for a lot of the 20th century, there's only a few Noongars trapped in this town, virtually the way these things work. And people are not feeling unable to go back there because of all that killing that occurred and can't get back to reconcile themselves to it and starting to happen here in this early 21st century. That again is that kangaroo and the moon story. This is not over yet, this story. So to go back on there and to reconcile yourself on private property in an age of native title when everyone's very nervy about this stuff, to go back there and start having conversations about human relationships, about history, about these stories we're bringing alive and what they mean to all of us through, through Noongar people at home. <coughs> I want to talk a little bit more. Oh, sorry about this, everyone. I get greedy. I'm a shy man, but I get greedy when I get up behind the microphone here. <laughs> I want to talk something about the nature of a few of the couple of these stories that we've come up with, that we've brought alive again. Um, strange. They are strange. They are so very modern, it seems to me. I've heard Noel Pearson and others talk about the importance of orbits, moving away from a home community and coming back to your home community better able to contribute. At least three of the half dozen stories we started playing with, reworking, bringing alive again. That's the structure of the narrative, a single protagonist. And that's unusual in my home community as well. We tend to move in groups a lot of the time. But a single protagonist moves away from his home community and takes considerable risks and trusts his heritage enormously. There's one of a, a whale rises next to a man in rocks, standing on rocks, and he remembers a song that his dad taught him about going inside a whale and making it, singing to it, and making it take you somewhere else. So he dances out onto the whale's back and goes into the whale and starts singing this song. See what I mean about trust, a heritage, trust yourself, take risks, and he makes the whale take him a long way. He strands the whale, comes out of the whale, and then there's his two women, naturally pretty impressed with him. <laughs> he's brought a feast, he's brought a party, a festivity. And then there's this funny lapse in the story, which I don't know how you'd work in the storytelling moment, where he is walking back into the rising sun, so he's going back east along the south coast. The two women with him, they're both pregnant, and a whole bunch of kids. So he's going back to his home territory, able to tell them about a bigger world than they yet know about. He's a hero back where he, where he arrived with the stranded whale. They all sing songs and party about him at every opportunity. He's going back 
to his home community, he's orbiting back. Better able to enrich that home community, to make connections to that other community that, where there wasn't these connections. So you see, I, I think that's modern. See, I think that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a, a story for modern times. Trust your heritage, take risks, be everything that you can be from that position as one among many unique manifestations of the spirit of that place, as someone privileged to be a descendant of people that first created human society in that part of the oldest continent on earth. And from this, I think, this is many, this is a long way off. It just opens the possibilities of grafting a contemporary community onto indigenous roots. I mean, I know that's a very, I don't say that glibly, and you need people in there, but the sort of reworking that can come, as I'm trying to indicate here, through stories, through these sort of processes. I'm not in, I don't know what I'm doing, I'm just improvising along with this stuff, to tell you the truth, because of my own needs, such as they are, and trying to do it as nice, as, as useful as I can. But it does open to me, it seems to open these possibilities for a transformation of who we are and how we belong in this part of the world. It also signals we have these contradictory narratives, the stolen generation, the continuity of native title. It signals that we have to bring them together so it's not just one or the other and we can have something more productive than just guilt and victimhood and uh, the fatalism that the repetition of many social indicators can create. This business of through regional indigenous roots, this is of what I'm speaking tentatively, giving us the means through those communities of descendants to anchor a shimmering nation state to its continent through relationships, through rebuilding, through recovery and those concentric circles. There's more of which I could speak. However, I see a few glazed eyes, so I better cut <laughs> while I'm ahead here. Thank you very much for your, um, you know, as I said, I'm very flattered to be invited here. I'm extremely flattered and gratified to see so many of you here. I'm even more flattered um, that you appear to be listening to me. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs> Sorry, can I forget to read it? Thanks, Kim, so much for that subtle and illuminating address. And uh, to conclude this part of the proceedings, I'd like to invite my co-convener, uh, co Ruby Lowe, to deliver an official vote of thanks. Ruby. What an honour it is to be a settler person and a student of English literature to stand on this stage tonight. On behalf of the University of Melbourne, I would like to thank Professor Scott for his lecture. However, I would also like to thank Kim Scott on behalf of a new generation of readers for creating new possibilities for speech in Australia. <laughs>